Dallas Theological Seminary's Chapel Podcast. Let me tell you a little bit about Linda Martin. Um, she received her bachelor's degree at Austin College in 78 and a master's degree at Dallas Theological Seminary in 85. Uh, is that correct? What happened to that? Oh, I'm down here on another guy. Would you like to have had a degree from Dallas Theological Seminary in 85? Let me, let me jump back up to Linda. <laughs> University of Northern Iowa. That's a little different, a little logistical problem in, in 71. PhD, University of North Texas in 1984. Um, she approaches her teaching and her classes with enthusiasm uh, for the counseling profession. And uh, her skills have been honed through her 35 years of client interactions in private practice. And she works with many different life problems. Her specialties are trauma and disassociation. Uh, she's uh, an LPC supervisor, member of the Christian Association of Psychological Studies, a clinical member of American Association of Marriage and Family Therapy. The thing I like about Linda is that she likes to shoot guns. And... Uh, <laughs> One day, uh, I was sitting in my office, and, uh, and uh, I said, uh, she walked by, and I said, Linda, I just inherited three guns from my late grandfather who raised me, a six-shooter, a twenty-two pistol, and a, a four-ten shotgun side-by-side double barrel. And I said, I have no idea how to shoot a gun. Could you, could you train me a little bit? And she said, I'll be glad to. Now, we haven't gone yet. But we're going to go, and she's going to teach me how to shoot a gun, okay? Um, anyway, this is, uh, she does more nuthetic counseling because of her shooting than she does, uh, yeah, so get over it uh, quick, okay? Let's welcome Dr. Linda Martin. Wow, I don't know what to do with that introduction. Uh, <laughs> Oh, that's funny. <sighs> All right, let me get organized a minute here. Uh, how does a lamb know its shepherd? Let me remind you, if you were, I don't know if you were here last summer, but I taught on um, Ephesians uh, 2.10 about how uh, God made us what we were, what we are, and, you know, he created us in Christ Jesus for the good works which he designed beforehand as our sphere of service. Uh, then I talked about the potter and the clay. Now, I, I kind of remind you of that kind of as a disclaimer for a couple things I'm going to be saying. So, yeah. John 10, 4, 5, and 6. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep recognize his voice and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. After he has gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them, and they follow him because they know his voice. They won't follow a stranger. They will run from him because they don't know his voice. So how does a lamb know its shepherd? When I turned 13 and was getting closer to that category of young womanhood, whatever that was, but it was a little intimidating, uh, there was only one thing I really wanted. It was not fingernail polish. It was not hose. It was not even that uh, spin the bottle first kiss. The only thing I wanted was a goat. See, see my disclaimer? I don't know why I wanted a goat. I wanted a goat. I begged my father for a goat. We lived on the edge of town and had 10 acres, so we had land behind the house with the barns and all that stuff. Uh, he laughed and said no. I begged and begged, and he just kept laughing. We'd had chickens before. I tried to tame them, uh, but a weasel got in and killed them. Uh, then we got a bullock, which is a young steer, and we raised that. Uh, we were going to eat it. I had a hard time getting close to it, knowing that later I would eat it. 
Um, so God saved me on that one. It was struck by lightning, and uh, by the time we got to it, it was unedible. So I figured now is the time, my opportunity to get a goat. On my 14th birthday, I was pretty excited, you know, every time my father had walked into the room, I'd kind of exaggerate my, my depression and my angst about not having what I really wanted. Didn't go anywhere. But my 14th birthday, well, I got some really nice clothes. My mother was pleased. So, uh, you know, went on school and all that, but about three days later, I came home from school, it was the end of February, and my father was unloading my gift. I know, you're expecting a goat? It wasn't a goat. It was two ewes, two adult sheep. Well, they weren't goats, but there were two of them, and they were pregnant. So I was, I was pretty excited. Well, I immediately named the bigger one, Bertha, after my grandmother, who was over 300 pounds. Uh, God made me who I am. Um, I named the second, the skinny, crabby one, I named Gertrude after a friend of my mother's who also kind of fit that description. <laughs> so I would forget schoolwork and my new clothes. I was now reading up on sheep and pregnancy and how to feed them and all that kind of stuff. I mean, this was, this was true education and really exciting. About a month later, I went out to the barn on a Saturday morning and Bertha had given birth, I mean, uh, Gertrude had given birth during the night. Twins, but they were both dead. She was a terrible mother. I don't know what she did. Uh, she didn't take care of them, or they may have frozen, but they were dead. Gert, uh, Bertha was in the process and struggling with, with obviously trying to give birth. So my father called the vet, came out there right away. Um, long and the short of it, Bertha died. She had given birth to twins, one of them died, one lamb was left. The vet cleaned it off, handed it to my father, who wrapped it in a blanket, who handed it to me. I became the mother of a lamb. Uh, I was pretty excited, I'll tell you. The, uh, I put a big cardboard box in my bedroom, right next to my bed, put newspapers and towels in the bottom, uh, named him Lambert, of course. I, I didn't know that was a classic name, but Lambert just fit. I would feed him, uh, of course, a bottle of milk. I held him a lot. I fed him a lot. Every two hours, you have to feed a newborn lamb. So in the middle of the night, I would hear this little bleeding. Uh, of course, I woke up immediately like good mothers do. And I got my bottle and fed, and I'd talk to him, and then I'd put my hand in the box while I'm laying there in bed, and we both go back to sleep for another two hours, and then repeat it. In the day when I had to go to school, I took the box downstairs into the kitchen where it was warm, and my mother took over as nursemaid, and she was really good at that. So this was how it started. He was a handsome Hampshire lamb. Those are the kind that have the black face and black ears and black feet and ankles. He was very good looking. Uh, <laughs> since the snow was melting I, and getting warmer, by then it was you know in March, I would take him outside. I would carry him on my arm like this, you know, with my, uh, his stomach and his chest here, and his long legs would just dangle. So we'd walk around the neighborhood like this because I was showing off my child, you know. <laughs> Let my friends have kittens and puppies, I had a lamb. Well, going around like this, Lambert became very sociable. He enjoyed people. All of this lasted for about 25 pounds, if you know what I mean, <laughs> okay. By then he could walk anyway, so I decided to let him walk with me and we walked around the neighborhood, uh, I should have been called Mary, you know what I mean? <laughs> he uh, 
gradually was introduced to Gertrude in the barn. I put out clean hay, made it soft. I'd, I'd sit out there with him or, or lie in the hay with him so that he would know that was still home, you know, this was our home, and I was still nearby. So he acclimated well out there. And since he was getting bigger, it was time for medical procedure. No, his gender was not modified. Uh, I wouldn't allow that. Uh, but he had a long tail. Did you know sheep were born with long tails? Yeah. Uh, they can get kind of nasty. And so you're supposed to cut the tail off. Well, uh, my father got the big head shears. I kept Lambert's front busy with his bottle of milk while my father positioned himself and the shears carefully in the back, and all of a sudden, whack. Okay. Short tail. I quickly put the stub in a cup of flour. That's what you do. Oh, I learned so much in this experience. It came in later when my chameleon lost its tail, and I just put you know, flour on it. <sighs> I know it hurt, but we did it as fast as we could and as pleasantly as, you know. I'd bring friends over to uh, see Lambert, but my favorite times were when we'd go out in the pasture and I would chase or he would chase, and then he would do the strangest thing. I didn't know they did this. He would lock his legs and he would start springing and bouncing. I don't know if you've ever seen that, it's wonderful. They literally, their legs are stiff and they spring and they bounce and he would spring and bounce all over on those sunny spring days and I would just laugh and I mean it was so fun watching the delight of this happy, uninhibited lamb. When my friends would come over, we'd go to the gate and uh, we'd go through the barn gate there and I'd call him with my bell. This is the bell. Believe it or not, half a century ago, this is the bell. It used to have a bunch of wool tied to it, but some little varmints, I think, ate it. You know. So my friends and I would go out there. He, uh, if he was a, he, he'd, Lambert would run up to us. He'd nuzzle my body. If he was afraid, he'd lean into my leg and just stand there until he was safe. Uh, if there was a group of us, he'd somehow find me. I didn't know if he knew my looks or my smell. I think it was my smell. Uh, one summer afternoon, um, see, Lambert and I had a lot of adventures, but this one stands out. One summer afternoon, my mother was having bridge club, two tables of bridge over at the house. So I had to make my appearance so they all would look at me, and then I'd leave, and, you know, and then the mothers all talk about their children, and they do, you know how it goes. So I went out in the back with Lambert, we were playing out there, got hot. So I came in the back in the kitchen to get a drink. Well, Lambert, it was his home originally, so he just followed me in there. Well, Lambert heard talking and laughter in the other room, and that little sociable creature ran in there. By then he's 70 pounds. He ran in there to meet everybody and went under each card table. The women were screaming. They didn't know what was coming. Well. Uh, I escaped quickly. Uh, it was not my most popular day with my mother. Uh, well, the next year I was almost 16. Things change. My folks were building a new house. It had no outbuildings. It was a nice house, you know. I told my dad, I mean, I knew Lambert had to go. I told my dad, now it couldn't be just any place. It had to be a place just as good or, or better than what Lambert was leaving. A few days later, I mean, my father said he had tried. didn't know how I was going to do that, but he knew people in town. Uh, a few days later, I came home from school. Gertrude and Lambert were gone. I had not gotten to say goodbye, but it was interesting because I was kind of half going on and growing up and half wanting to hang on to my childhood, you know what I mean, that in between. So I was almost relieved I didn't have to say goodbye to Lambert because it, it might have been too hard and I know I was moving on. My father had found a home for him with a shop teacher at school who had a little farm. He had just bought at auction a group of young ewes 
And he needed a frisky lamb, a ram, excuse me, Lambert was growing up. He needed a frisky ram. Talk about Lambert going to heaven. <laughs> so, I could let go knowing where Lambert was. I know this is just a simple memory of a girl from small Iowa town, but I was a shepherd for a while. So how does a lamb know its shepherd? Well, you could probably hear that as you listen to my story. It's the collection of together times. It's embedded in the voice. The together times are embedded in that voice. Times of rescue, of nourishment, of protection from hurt and comfort in pain. It's the relaxed, quiet times and the times of shared delight. To the shepherd, his sheep are beautiful, and they mean everything to him. To the lamb, the voice of love and the fragrance of love are forever compelling. Now, so this Christmas, when you watch It's a Wonderful Life for the ninth or 20th time, and you see the little bell on the tree ring, don't fall for that spurious theology of an angel just got its wings. Instead, think of the bell, this sound, okay? Think of the bell rung by the shepherd that calls, calls the sheep to come and delight in him. Okay, let's pray. <sighs> Holy Father, uh, we praise you and, and, and thank you for providing Jesus as our loving and uh, ever-present shepherd prompt us to lean into him when we're afraid of anything or when life is rough. Help us to accept his love and his delight in us. Let us rest in that. Amen. <laughs>